and I have with us today um, for this event, which is called Alice's Book, How the Nazi Stole My Grandmother's Cookbook, author Karina Erbach. And I'm going to start by introducing Karina and then a, a special second guest. Uh, Karina Erbach, in this book, she um, tells the story of her family torn apart by the Nazi regime and of a woman who, with her unwavering passion for cooking, survived the horror and losses of the Holocaust to begin a new life in America and to fight a uh, fight for restitution that lasted eight decades. A very interesting um, aspect of restitution that we'll talk about. Karina Erbach is a German historian who received her doctorate from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. From 2015 to 2021, she was a long-term visitor at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Her most recent books are Go-Betweens for Hitler, 2017, and the novel Cambridge Five, written under the pseudonym Hannah Kohler, which won the Crime Cologne Award in 2018. Her new monograph, Alice's book, has been translated into six languages now. It was made into a documentary for German television in 2022. And in addition, we have a special guest today. We also have uh, her cousin Katrina Erbach, and we'll learn later why their names are so similar, I believe. Um, so Katrina, uh, thank you for joining us. Katrina is here in the United States, and she knew Alice personally. Whereas, uh, Karina, you grew up more hearing about Alice, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so um, before we uh, continue, I'll just say the Leo Beck Institute is a library and archive dedicated to German-speaking Jewish history in Europe from its earliest times up to and through the Holocaust. Um, as such, we have 80,000 books in our library. We have 40,000 archival collections some which range from just one or two folders of material to some which are dozens or even over a hundred boxes of material. Um, a little housekeeping before we begin. Um, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And after the presentation, um, I will have a brief discussion with both Karina and Katrina, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So you can leave your questions there in the Q&A. Okay, so um, I think to, to begin, uh, Karina, why don't we start with your presentation? So Sophie will operate that. So we'll wait a second till that is up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Karina, this is the yeah, first slide. So you can take it away from here. Oh, thank you so much. That was wonderful, Michael, for introducing um, our American book launch. And um, perhaps you see on this first slide, it's a, it's a bit of a showing off slide, I'm afraid, um, because I was so happy that um, my German book, Das Buch Alice, was translated into these six languages. And uh, the Chinese edition isn't here yet. But um, and, and as you can see, um, every country had a different cover. And of course, uh, my absolute favorite one is is the um, UK cover and that's in the middle, it's Alice's book. Um, and uh, one thing they all had in common were the photos of Alice's hands. And that's really important later on, um, her hands, um, these photos were taken from her cookbook. Um, the Italians didn't do that. The Italians, you know, cultural differences, wanted some good looking women on the cover. So <laughs> they have um, Cordelia Dodson, who is also um, a protagonist in this book, um, a very impressive young lady. So she is on the Italian cover. Okay, um, perhaps slide two, this is now really serious. This is what the whole thing is about. It is, um, about two cookbooks and a riddle that we had to solve. Um, we, Katrina, my cousin Katrina in America, and me knew, of course, that Alice had written cookbooks and that her most famous cookbook was um, So Kocht Man in Wien, Cooking the Viennese Way. And that's the book on the left. Um, and that book uh, came out in uh, 1935, 36. But as you can see on the right, there is um, the same title So Kocht Man in Wien um, by a man called Rudolf Rösch. And um, this book was published in 1939. 
So why were these two cookbooks there and um, what had happened in those two years? Um, uh, it's also important perhaps to say that this Rudolf Roche is explained um, in the introduction um, as a, a master chef, a Viennese master chef, and um, a member of the NS, the Nazi Reich Food Ministry. So um, we will hear later on whether he really was that or not. Anyway, um, picture three, please, um, Sophie. Uh, could you show the picture of, yes, this is um, Alice's father, Sigmund Meyer, and um, he is the key to um, her fame in some ways, because when I read her short biography, um, she wrote 24 pages about her life. He um, is uh, mentioned, but um, I didn't understand why Alice knew all these very famous Viennese people, like, um, <laughs> you know, Felix Salten, who wrote Bambi, or um, Anna Freud, who was the daughter, of course, of Sigmund Freud. And the reason why she knew um, all these people was her father, Sigmund Meyer, because he was a quite well-known uh, politician, local Viennese politician. He was also a writer, journalist for the Viennese press for um, several newspapers in Vienna. And he was also um, a very rich textile um, merchant. And he wrote several books and we have uh, today, I think on the Zoom, we have Dr. Michael Livni, um, a relative of mine in Israel, who is the absolute expert on Sigmund Meyer and who could really answer any questions on this man. Um, Sigmund Meyer was uh, in some ways very um, unusual because he was, um, despite being blind, he managed to make this enormous career to leave the Pressburg ghetto. He was still born in Bratislava, what we call Bratislava today, and um, made this enormously impressive career. And as a local politician, he managed to um, argue, not just with the anti-Semitic mayor of um, uh, Vienna, Karl Weger, but he also picked a fight with Theodor Herzl um, because he was completely anti-Zionist and um, he believed in assimilation. And Alice says in her biography, well, perhaps if he had um, known what happened in the Holocaust, he might have changed his mind. So yeah, he, um, he very much attacked Theodor Herzl, but um, they were in the end buried in the same cemetery in Vienna. So they had that in common. Um, perhaps we can have picture four, please, Sophie. Um, yes, this is um, showing Alice sitting down on a bench here with her uh, younger sister, Helene. And she is in a dirndl, and I just thought this is important to understand how far this assimilation went. I mean, she grew up in this um, rich Jewish family, but of course, um, she felt Austrian first and um, yeah, most importantly at this time. And um, later on in life, she bought <laughs> Katrina and me dirndls. <laughs> and um, I think we both we built great disappointment for her because we were not the type, we were both jeans types, so we never wore our dirndls. I think Katrina didn't wear hers either. Um, but they are very pretty. But of course, they show that um, how much she was assimilated and her um, uh, beautiful sister in the background um, later on became a, the, a lawyer, the, the second uh, female lawyer in Vienna who did a PhD and um, uh, uh, an academic from the Viennese University has just contacted me about her because she is researching her life. So that's Helene in the background. Uh, unfortunately, Helene died a horrible death, um, like so like so many um, of Alice's relatives. Um, uh, I perhaps can um, read a very short extract uh, from Alice's memoir where she explains her, her background and um, growing up in, in pre-war, I'm talking about First World War, um, the Habsburg Empire. Um, she, she had this wealthy background, but then of course um, in 1918, everything collapses. As we all know, the Habsburg Empire um, falls apart. Uh, there is a Great Depression in Vienna. Uh, her family loses all her money. Uh, she is uh, married to a husband who is um, gambling away her inheritance. So um, she was completely um, 
destitute in some ways in, in 1918. And when her husband dies in 1920s, she is alone with two little boys, my um, father Otto and Katrina's father Karl. And um, she doesn't know how to make money. Um, so she, she writes here, I had not learned anything to earn money. I had had singing and piano lessons. I traveled a lot with my parents and learned art and geography in this very pleasant way. The usual education of girls in first class families not having any particular talents. Well, that's very um, humble of her to say because she did have talents. She, for example, was a very passionate cook. Cooking had been something that she had started at the age of five. She had admired the um, cook in the house and um, she had always tried to uh, learn cooking. She had been to a few cooking lessons, but it wasn't really very well regarded by her family. It was said, you know, upper class girls don't do cooking. I mean, that is nothing important. Um, you shouldn't ever consider a career as a chef or running a restaurant. And of course, in Vienna, there were very few women who were doing that. I mean, Anna Sacher is the great exception, Anna Sacher running the Hotel Sacher. That was very, very unusual. They um, didn't take all these big um, confesseries, didn't take any female apprentices. So um, Alice was just cooking up to then um, for fun. And uh, now suddenly she turns it into a career. And that is um, something that uh, she is overnight very, very successful at. And perhaps we can see picture um, four now yes that's, thank you um this is one of the many newspaper articles that are written in the 1920s about alice and um her great entrepreneurial ideas she had a wonderful sister called sidoni who helped her along who had already written um herself um for um cooking uh, journals and um now alice has this idea she could give cooking classes to um, rich ladies and she could do catering. And here it says, um, Americanization everywhere, um, Americanisierung all über all, um, because Alice had this great idea to do catering. I mean, something we of course uh, take for granted, but which was very unusual in the 1920s. So she, um, brings whole three course meals, four course meals into the house and she does catering for parties. And um, you can see here on the right, perhaps Urbach menu in house. So um, she cooks for the rich friends of her sister, Helene. Helene is the only one who has money and who's giving these famous bridge parties. And, um, and she, she suddenly gets confidence because that was something she didn't have, of course. Um, she had this bad marriage losing all the money, having two little children. So it was all pretty depressing, but now she is um, at the uh, top of her game. She runs this cooking school. She runs the catering service. She has cooking exhibitions. She gives um, lectures about cooking all over Vienna. And she writes with her sister Zidoni, the first cookbook in 1925. It is a small cookbook, but um, of course she will soon write a much more important one. Okay, could we have picture um, six and seven? So these um, are photos from her 1935 cookbook. Um, these are photos of her pupils uh, cooking in um, Goldeckgasse. That's where um, Alice had a cooking school. It's a beautiful uh, street, very close to the Belvedere. Perhaps you, you've been to Vienna and the Belvedere has all the climbs. And so it is a um, wonderful street. And, um, and here are her pupils um, at work. And um, perhaps photo seven shows um, how um, these um, action photos, in those days action photos, were included in the cooking book. And um, it is a great success. It's a book that she uh, writes now in 1935. So it is not um, her first cookbook, but it is her most important one. It's 500 pages. It is not just recipes. It's about housekeeping. It's about how to give children's parties, how to give dinner parties, how you should um, have um, healthy eating, how what you do when you burn your hands, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a self-help book, self-help book as well. Yes, and um, perhaps picture eight shows you this. This is So Kocht man in Wien. This is the, the book that she published in 1935. Here we have um, a 1938 edition. 
and um, it also has color filters. So um, it is a it's a great success in 1935. It becomes a bestseller, and it was commissioned by a German publishing house. So the publishing house is in Munich. It's called Ernst Reinhardt Verlag, and they wanted this Viennese cookbook, and they commissioned the book. And um, wait a second, which picture do I have next? Yeah, um, could we have the next one, please? Okay, now, as you see, absolutely identical. Um, the same picture, it's 1939, it's the 1939 edition. So what has happened between, by the way, if you hear noise in the background, that's the dog drinking water. Yeah, sorry about that. So what happened between the 1938 and 1939 edition? Of course, as, as you all know, um, uh, a disaster happens in, in March 1938, the Nazis march into Austria. And um, that is uh, the day that changes Alice's life. And um, from then on, she is in great danger and her son, Karl, Katrina's, my cousin Katrina's father, is in great danger as well. My father was a bit luckier. He had already gone to America on a uh, student exchange, so he was safe in Portland, Oregon, um, having his own little adventures, which I'm covering in the book because he joined the intelligence forces, etc. But that's a different story. Anyway, Alice is in great danger. She um, immediately loses her job and, um, and Carl, her son, who is of course very, very young. Um, he's, I think in his second year at university, he's thrown out of university. He's a medical student and um, he loses everything as well. And um, they are now trying to get out of Austria. And it's a story that I'm sure you have all heard very often, um, how difficult it was to, uh, to get out, that one is trying to get every Davids, that people are trying to um, suddenly remember anyone they know in America, in Paraguay, in Mexico, anyone who, who can get them out and, and help them to get these every Davids. And, um, Alice is um, very lucky because she has a relative in Britain and um, the British government uh, since 1933 had um, a wonderful scheme and that was a scheme that rescued a lot of German Jewish women and later on Austrian Jewish women. They had the domestic permits and the domestic permits um, helped these women to get um, a job as a domestic. I mean, in Britain, we call it domestic. In America, you would say staff or, um, you know, from cleaners to cooks, just domestic staff. So with these domestic permits, you were allowed to enter Britain because as you know, the British um, had, of course, um, the interwar years wasn't easy for them either. They had a depression too. There was a lot of unemployment and um, that was a way by the British government to help refugees without upsetting um, their own population. And um, still people, some people thought that of course, all these refugees were taking away their jobs, but, um, in general, the British were very welcoming, and um, that was a, a huge, huge relief for Alice. So she escapes to Britain. She is terribly thankful about that chance she is getting in Britain. Um, but before she leaves, her publishing house um, makes her sign a declaration, and that later on becomes very important because in this declaration, she gives away the rights to <clears throat> three books. She had um, written two more manuscripts for this publisher, and um, this publisher now makes her sign away all her rights in 1938. Of course, under the rest, but I mean, you would sign anything if somebody puts a gun to your head. So she signs it and, um, and, and vanishes. And of course, uh, she doesn't know what happens to her book now for the next 10 years. So she comes to Britain. And Sophie, could we have the um, next photo, please? Okay, so this sounds amazing, but she does work in um, a very... Um, impressive country house. It's called Harlex Manor and it's in Grantham. And interestingly enough, Grantham is uh, very famous for another um, a lady. Um, that's Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister, Margaret Thatcher, uh, grew up in Grantham. And interestingly enough, um, her parents who were um, having the local shop took in um, a Jewish refugee girl as well. So um, Alice was um, going to Grantham and um, working 
in this castle um, and probably ran into Margaret Sancher in the local shop. But um, in Grantham, she is hired by um, a very eccentric lady called Mrs. Violet van der Elst. Uh, she is a millionaire um, who made a lot of money with soap, um, cosmetics and soap. And um, Violet van der Elst is a self-made woman. She is also um, a big campaigner. Perhaps we can see the next photo, please, Sophie. Um, that's Mrs. Violet van der Elst having an argument with a policeman. Um, she is... Uh, uh, relatively um, forgotten nowadays, but she was quite um, impressive because she fought against uh, capital punishment in Britain and um, was instrumental in um, capital punishment being abolished in, in Britain in the 1960s. So um, she did uh, achieve that in the end. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't very popular with the staff. So um, Alice... <laughs> And everybody else who worked for Violet van der Elst um, felt very put upon. Uh, she was a horrible boss. She, she really made them work terribly hard and woke them up at three in the morning to change the bed linen and things like that. I mean, she was a bit of a nutter, we would say now, but at least she had this good side to her. And, you know, the capital punishment crusade was, of course, wonderful that she achieved that. So Violet van der Elst takes in um, refugees. Um, lots of other um, impressive people like Anthony Eaton do that too. And and um, of course, Anthony Eden, the foreign secretary and later prime minister, is, um, is one of um, the people that Alice admires because he stands up to Hitler and he has um, left um, the government um, during appeasement and later on um, helps Churchill to fight Hitler. So um, it is a great honor for Alice to work for um, one of Anthony Eden's relatives. Um, I think um, it was a pretty tough job, but she didn't complain about it. So she wasn't a Mona. Um, okay, um, now, wait a second. Um, yeah, we have uh, Van der Elst. Could we have the next photo, please? I don't want to keep you too long because we want to discuss all these things. So the next photo. Okay, so while Alice is um, cooking for this um, eccentric millionaire, um, something horrible happens in Vienna. Her son, Karl, is um, arrested on um, 10th of November. As you all know, 9th of November is the night of um, Kristallnacht, um, the pogrom in Germany, and the Austrians were a bit late. They um, were a day late, but um, they were even more vicious, if one can be more vicious, and um, rounded everyone up. And um, Karl was very unfortunate because he, he was on his way um, to the um, immigration office to pick up his last papers for um, going to America. My, my father and his friends, um, Cordelia Dodson, had um, finally got all the papers ready for him. And yeah, at that very moment, um, on the 10th of November, shortly after his 21st birthday, um, he is arrested um, and uh, sent to Dachau. Um, Alice's brother is also arrested in this pogrom. Um, he is um, beaten up and sent to various Viennese prisons. And um, his story, his name is Felix, his story is in the book as well. I'm, I'm not going to tell you about all these other um, characters because it would um, distract us from um, the main issue tonight and that's restitution and um, the theft of Alice's book. But um, what Felix um, experiences on, on the Isle of Man and, and it, is very, very interesting because um, he becomes an enemy alien later on by the British. Okay, now um, this is a picture of Alice um, on the left um, uh, together with Paula Sieber. And because Karl is at Dachau concentration camp, she um, thinks she has to do something really important and help other refugees. And of course she tries to get him out, but she is stuck in England. So she has to leave it to um, her son Otto, to her relatives, um, Robert Orbach. And I think um, today, um, Robert Orbach, daughter um, uh, is, is on this Zoom call as well, Renate Reiner. So, um, so she, um, she can't do anything, but the people who are still in Vienna, the relatives who are still in Vienna, Vienna and my father in America are helping and um, finally achieving in 1939 that Karl can get out of Dachau. Like um, many others, there was a big release um, of prisoners um, uh, only of prisoners, of course, who could prove that they had an affidavit and a ticket to America or Paraguay or wherever. So um, 
Alice uh, is so relieved and so thankful that she wants to do something useful for children. And of course, she sees her son Carl as a child. So she, um, she gives up a well-paid job and takes on a really tough job. She um, takes on a, a hostel, running a hostel in Newcastle. And um, I think on, on this Zoom, we have um, uh, Sue Kamis, um, who is um, the daughter of one of the um, girls that um, Alice looked after. Um, her, her mother, Ilse Kamis, I, I still had the, the privilege to um, interview for this book. And Unfortunately, she died in um, 2020, um, but she was um, uh, one of these um, girls Alice looked after in, um, in Newcastle and then uh, later on in Windermere. Um, and um, of course, um, Ilse Camus was um, a, a very um, resilient and very cheerful girl and, um, and uh, had a, a very successful life later on. But um, some other children, of course, were very traumatized. They had to leave their parents and it wasn't easy. So it was a very tough job that Alice and Paula Zieber took on. And perhaps we can show a photo. Could we have the next photo, please, of the girls? And I think Ilse is not on this photo, but you can see Alyssa, another <laughs> girl I interviewed. She is um, in the back row, the second from the right. And um, she's the cheeky uh, a laughing one. So um, she lives today in Israel and we um, interviewed her for our TV documentary. And um, a, a wonderful lady um, who, uh, yeah, has um, very, very charming, I think 10, 10 or 12 um, grandchildren now. So um, yes, that, that was the time in Windermere. And of course, um, we can talk about all this later, um, but you want to get back to the cookbook. So um, can we have picture 14? Okay, and that's now essential because Alice returns to uh, Vienna in 1949 uh, for her first visit. And uh, we had to recreate the scene uh, for our uh, documentary. So we have um, the lady on the left playing Alice. She's a bit too young perhaps, but um, she's playing Alice. And we had to recreate the scene where she is uh, coming to Vienna standing in front of a bookshop and it's a true scene that is, has been de described in the book um, and uh, sees for the first time her cookbook and realizes it has this man's name on it, Rudolf Wesch, and she is flabbergasted and shocked and she doesn't know um, how this could happen and she wants her book back. And um, and the other photo, by the way, on the in the corner on the right, um, that's me with Professor Murray Hall um, from the University of Vienna, and I'm interviewing him in the um, in a um, Judenplatz. It's called Judenplatz. It's um, it's a uh, near the wonderful uh, Holocaust memorial that um, was built there, and the whole memorial is um, books. <laughs> That was very fitting. It's made out of books. So, um, so okay, th this is the, um, the problem now. Alice sees her um, cookbook, doesn't understand what has happened, and she starts writing to her publisher. And uh, this man was called Hermann Jung, and um, she writes him very polite letters um, saying again and again um, that she is um, still alive. <laughs> I think he was shocked about that and um, that she completely understands, of course, that he couldn't publish her book um, under Nazi law, but she would like to have it back, please. And, um, and he writes very, very evasive letters back to her. We don't have these letters, but we only have her letters. So um, in her letters, she's still polite and says, yes, I do understand. Um, of course, you couldn't act differently and I don't blame you, but could I please have my authorship back? Okay, that doesn't happen. And um, in 1953, she writes the following letter, but she is losing patience a bit. She is in Vienna again. And she writes, the Aryan edition of the book in the window is in the window of every bookshop. You can imagine that it breaks my heart, especially when every bookseller says, this is the most popular cookbook people hardly ever ask for or buy anything else. So she asks to get it back, um, but he doesn't give it back to her. Um, of course, we can discuss later what she could have done. She could have sued him if she had the money. Um, and it would have been a very long and very tough court case. Um, so she doesn't do it. And in um, 1966, can we have picture 15, please? 
1966, uh, the book is still uh, published under the name of Rudolf Rösch and um, the German publishing house just continues and never listens to any of her complaints and um, license it to several countries, to Austria, Switzerland, etc. So um, this Rudolf Rösch, whoever he was, uh, that's the only thing I didn't find out. So to this day, I don't know who he was because um, there are lots of Rudolf Rösch in, in Germany and Austria. And um, I checked, of course, his party membership. Um, there were many Rösches who were NSDAP members, um, but uh, none of them were cooks. I also checked um, all the address books in Vienna, um, which um, cooks in it, but no. Um, perhaps he didn't exist. There is a, a little a snippet from one newspaper that he gave um, that a Rudolf Rösch um, was on the local radio, could have been him. Um, I um, phoned a lot of people with the surname Rudolf Rösch because I hope perhaps this is the grandson named after the infamous father, grandfather, but uh, no such luck. So perhaps the publishing house invented him. Um, that's something they never ever told me. Um, that was of course the problem from the beginning. I had lots of archives um, I visited, but the only archive I could never get access to um, was uh, the uh, archive of this publishing house that stole Alice's book, the Ernst Reinhardt Verlag. I wrote to them and they said, very sorry, um, our archives were um, lost in the Second World War. Okay, that was an excuse that many publishing houses used at the time. Um, they only changed their mind when this book about Alice came out in German in 2020. And the Spiegel, which is one of our um, best political magazines in Germany, ran a big article about it. And um, I think they were a bit worried. And then they um, contacted me. And the CEO was a very uh, nice lady. And um, I said to her, listen, Katrina and me, we don't want any financial compensation. We just want Alice's name back on the book cover. And, um, and this very nice lady did do that for us. And she gave us back uh, the copyright and um, made it possible. And perhaps we can have um, a picture of the next picture. It's picture 18, I think. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. This is a good one too. Um, yeah, yeah, we can leave it. I just wanted to say, um, Alice moved on, you know, and uh, went to America after um, having lost this fight against um, her publisher. And here in America, she is seen in San Francisco um, with her uh, pupils in a wonderful um, cooking school. And she was teaching, of course, Viennese cooking to a young generation of girls. And, um, and there's um, the next photo, please, um, where she, I love that photo. It is an action photo of her with a big saucepan. So um, she was in her 90s when she was teaching. She was on American television on PBS as the oldest cooking teacher in America. And uh, she was very uh, proud of that and, and happy that she had this um, bit of recognition, which I think she had deserved, of course, much earlier and uh, much more, especially by, um, by the Austrians. But um, unfortunately, that was not to be. Anyway, coming back to our success. So when Katrina and I said, we don't want any financial compensation, et cetera, we just want her to be the author again. Um, we were successful. We have pleased picture 19. Um, this is our uh, great success. This is um, the, the nice CEO of Ernst Reinhardt Verlag, the nice lady um, who contacted me said, yes, we, um, we feel that we have acted more in a bad more way and um, we want to give you back the book. So, so they published this book and with Alice's name on it and um, they asked us what to do with, um, with the copies and Katrina and I said, um, please give them to all the um, Austrian and German libraries. So we sent them um, to the libraries and now Alice is um, the author of her own book again. And perhaps there is another ending as well. Last picture, please. And then I finally hand over. Um, and the um, Viennese were um, very good about Alice's um, sisters um, because they had gave her a stone of remembrance. And um, this is um, the 
Stone of Remembrance is a, is a wonderful organization in Vienna and they have these little plaques and they put that in front of the houses where uh, Holocaust um, people who were murdered in the Holocaust um, lived. That was their last address. And, um, and here you can see the, the last address of um, Alice's um, talented and um, a wonderful um, sister Helene, her husband, and um, of Alice's um, sister Sidonie and Caroline, who helped her so much um, and who were all, uh, three of them were, were murdered um, in, um, well, Helene in Litzmannstadt and um, or Lodge and, um, and the other two in gas chambers. So, um, they got the plaque and, and that, that was wonderful. And um, my Viennese friends all came and um, Harald, who's I think on the Zoom as well, um, gave a wonderful speech at that occasion because I couldn't be in Vienna. But um, they, of course the greatest success for Katrina and me was to get Alice's book back. And um, yes, I hope you have lots of questions now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. That was really interesting. I actually do have quick follow-up. When, when, when is the book going to be available to an American audience? I actually put a link in through Amazon to it, but some people wrote and said that it actually is not yet available here. Oh, but. that's right. Yeah. Um, well, it is. Um, we had our big um, book launch on, on Thursday here and um, in, in the UK. And um, and so uh, I think you have the Amazon UK link. So um, you can just click on it and um, and order it uh, from from Amazon England. Yes, okay. I think Katrina is better at this. She, she, she has all the links. She knows. Oh, that's okay. Sophie, I'll ask if you could just put it in the chat. So, so I think I put the American Amazon. Oh, oh yeah, the American Amazon hasn't got it. So, but you, as an American, you can order it from the English Amazon yeah. as well. Okay, good. So, wanted to correct that first. So, um, uh, I wanted to uh, begin talking about it because about your work. Thank you for the presentation as well, uh, Karina. Because it also it brings up a really interesting topic. I think um, that is little discussed, and that is in fact the loss of authorship or copyright or rights to publish work um, from the Nazi time. And um, I was just wondering um, if you know, do they know, I know you've done a lot of research on this, do they have any figures or any exact numbers at all? Do they know how many things this might have happened yeah. to? Well, this is, this is the thing because we are completely at this, beginning of this uh, research. So um, nobody ever um, showed any interest in this. I mean, nobody ever noticed that this had happened. And this is really bizarre because we know about um, uh, famous pictures being stolen. We know about factories, Jewish factories being Aryanized, houses, etc. cetera. But um, that nonfiction books were Aryanized um, has, had never been uh, researched before. And um, in this way, um, I was really glad to find Alice's story because it led me to other stories. You know, in the book, I'm describing um, other authors um, who were victims, and I, I found um, colleagues of mine, for example, a, a colleague who who gave his whole life to researching this um, Jewish author who had written medical books. I mean, that's perhaps a bit obscure, not to Katrina, she's a pediatrician, but you know, <laughs> um, medical books were, of course. Um, uh, also stolen and um and this man who had um written you know standard but really important textbooks um his whole life life's work was stolen by um a nazi also um also a medic but um who had never written a word and who just um took over the bestseller of this jewish author and um and wrote and published it under his name um till his death and um this colleague of mine um, wrote about it in the 1990s and nobody ever took any notice of it and he was so glad when I turned up and he said oh my god I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one who found the case and from that onwards you know we connected we became a group of people who um, there were a lot of um, there for example um, law um, experts you know um, uh, U.S. Prudence legal experts who also noticed that um, books were stolen by Jewish lawyers and had been taken over by Nazis, and um, and uh, we 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 now 
connect and, and help each other. And, um, and we, we get more and more cases, nonfiction books, of course, you can't steal fiction. That's, that's more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, this is maybe a question for both of you. Um, so maybe we'll start with um, you, Karina, because you wrote the book, and then we'll turn to Katrina. And that is, how do you think Alice, I mean, she tried for decades herself to get this book back, to, to be known, reclaimed as the author of this book. And how do you think, personally, she dealt with that? I mean, she didn't give up, apparently. She always seems to have pursued it, sometimes more, sometimes less. Well, I, of course, Katrina grew up with Alice and I, I just saw Alice, you know, in the summer holidays occasionally. So I, 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 I can't um, really answer that so well. I think that like many um, um, Holocaust survivors, she didn't want to be defined by this one thing in her life. She didn't want, you know, to be a victim. And nowadays, this is very difficult for us to understand because nowadays everybody wants to be a victim. But that generation did, that generation said no. They won't. They won't um, get me down. You know, I will. I will continue my life. I won't become bitter. I. I will um, build a new life, and I don't want to be defined by this one horrible um, thing that happened to me. So I think that that was her take. But Katrina knows her much better. So. Yeah, Katrina, do you do you have any insight? It, it's interesting looking at all of Karina's research now compared to the grandmother that I grew up with and the stories that she told, because the bitterness wasn't there, at least in what she told me about. We did sit down at certain times. I was 28 years old when she died, so I knew her for a long time, and we sat down sometime when I was in high school, and she went through the family history with me. Um, it, more actually on the her married side of the family she was very close to that family mm -hmm. and she knew a lot of the gossip and <laughs> all these crazy mm -hmm. stories she told me she told me who died who who perished in concentration camps who committed suicide because they were too afraid of what was going to happen and who survived and what they were doing she knew a lot of little facts she really didn't talk about the cookbook very much. It, it's so fascinating to me now to read this book and realize how difficult her life was. I mean, it was just an atrocious life. One thing after another, except, I mean, the cookbook and her cooking school were a huge source of pride to her. Those were a few years um, that were really, mm -hmm. I think, wonderful for her. And she did talk about those good years, her cooking school, her pupils, her how much fun she had. Um, she didn't talk so much about all the difficulties that she had when, at least when I knew her. I, it, I wish now that I could go back and listen to her talking to my father, because I'm sure with him, she shared more of her frustration. I think she, when she did die, she had a diagnosis of depression, which was interesting to me. Um, because I just didn't see that side of her. I think she wanted us to have a happy life and she did not want to wallow in the past. She just wanted to keep moving forward. She walked into that cooking school when she was 91 years old in San Francisco and said, you, you don't, she was totally deaf. So whatever anyone muttered, you know, that she couldn't hear, she just was oblivious to, she, you don't have a Viennese cooking class. You need a pastry class. I'm the one to teach it. And they, okay. And uh, it was very popular. <laughs> she taught it for several years. It was a crazy thing. She was confident and she was, um, that was her element, but she just didn't talk about it. I just, she also got some money back, not for the book. Um, you know, once the Austrian government or whoever set up the National Fund of Restitution, she got some money for her school. Uh, you know, restitution for her business. And I think at that point, she may have thought that was the end of it, that there was no avenue to pursue. My father pursued it still after she died. And both Karina's mother and my, my mother, the, the payment came in later, um, got a pittance of a, you know, restitution eventually. But I think she probably, once she got a payout, 
and I don't even know how much it was. It wasn't massive. She probably thought there's nothing else I can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a story I hear commonly enough from people. Yeah. So um, did I, I was wondering what kind of, this goes back to you, Karina, what kind of research you had to do. I mean, this, this obviously took a lot of research to find, uh, to, to even just to connect with all these people on similar cases of authors, issues of authorship and Jewish authorship. And um, I guess, I'm sure you talk about this in the book and stuff, but I'm, I'm sure you also used a lot of, oh, I know you did, you used a lot of physical archives and did a lot of research. And I think that comes out in, in the documentary as well. Yes, I mean, you, you are, for example, the Leo Beck Institute is wonderful. I mean, you have such a wonderful collection and, um, and um, of course, you are a very unusual archivist and, and um, uh, the director there um, as well. But um, you, people like you were essential. And um, the Leo Beck had, for example, Felix's, um, Alice's brother's um, papers. And he wrote about, I mean, he is a fascinating person as well. He wrote about his time um, on the Isle of Man, um, which is something that the British are very interested over here because that was um, in 1940 when uh, the, um, the refugees are declared enemy aliens and um, the men are imprisoned. And um, so he was um, imprisoned for a while. Um, but so so this archive um, it was wonderful. Then of course, Katrina giving me um, all these um, letters, you know, um, my, my father uh, wrote letters to Alice um, a lot in the 1930s and to Carl to get them out of Vienna. So these are very uh, panicky letters. These are very um, action-ridden letters. And, and of course, I, I use them a lot for, for the book. And of course, the tape. I mean, in the tape, she talks about um, looking after all these traumatized children and all their problems. And um, the tapes that Katrina found were, were essential. Um, and then um, <laughs> uh, my editor, at some point, my German editor says, so, so uh, please stop, you know, too many people coming in this book because there was also the, the friendship Carl had with um, Cordelia Dodson. This is a fascinating lady um, who um, helps as well in getting Carl out of um, Vienna. And she later on becomes an intelligence officer like my father. They, they were both working for the American government and Cordelia um, was very essential um, in, in other um, uh, famous cases. So she gets a whole chapter in my book because the Italians, when they translated um, the Alice book were particularly interested in her because she did a lot um, in um, the, the, the famous um, Pucci case and, um, and the, uh, she worked for Alan Dulles. And um, so, yes, I mean, uh, there are intelligence um, papers that I looked at in, in, in the National Archives in Washington, of course, find, trying to find out more about my father. Um, <laughs> that was also very exciting. And then uh, the Viennese um, archives um, for the Jewish community, I'm sure lots of listeners know about this. They, they, they were um, very helpful, um, essential, and lots of private papers. I mean, um, there, there are a few relatives, I think, on this Zoom. So they, they, they were very generous and gave me their private papers and people in Israel helped a lot. So it was, um, I had enormous support. I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I also think when it's such an interesting thing about your book, Karina, and about your grandmother's story is that she did, you know, go through so many trials. And of course, um, in that way, this to me is kind of different than a lot of books one would read about the Holocaust, because a lot of times it kind of starts, because people were quite young who would still be writing about it today, right? Kind of starts where they're already in this kind of middle-class utopian space within that text, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and of course, Alice did not have that life. She had to reinvent herself in Vienna in the 1920s, which yep. was also a very, I don't think people realize probably, uh, well, people maybe in this audience certainly do, but in general, the, the lack of food in Vienna at that time, the amount of poverty after the war, and actually even the amount of, young Viennese children who were sent to live in other countries and elsewhere yes. because there was just no food. It was so hard economically. So for yes. Alice to have made a name for herself in that environment as a woman is really 
really quite something, I think. I think the 1920s um, were, in some ways, a great chance for women. Of course, it was um, a terrible time, the, the depression in, in Austria. But um, if you were um, as tough as Alice, I mean, she became tough. Um, she wasn't born that way, but she had to toughen up. Um, uh, and you were um, ready to, to work hard. You could really um, build a little career. And the um, women um, who had been very sheltered, middle class women, were suddenly becoming entrepreneurs but you're absolutely right I mean the the poverty was enormous the there were um, the American soup kitchens for example were um, uh, for the first time uh, introduced um, in in Vienna after the war and um, and all the children um, had to go there and um, well all the children but I mean the majority of um, Austrian children um, were um, below the poverty line and uh, so they associated something very positive with America because they associated food with America. And um, yes, uh, Alice herself said that she often sent her sons to um, uh, Czechoslovakia because people were rich in Czechoslovakia and she had relatives there. So it was a great chance. Um, everything um, outside Austria <laughs> seemed better off. I mean, Austria was in a horrible, horrible state at that point, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's also it's also it's just interesting to think of how, you know, like I think it was very chilling, for example, in your presentation to see this book still with Rosa's name on it from the '60s or '70s. That really mm -hmm. hits at home. I think that this wasn't really such a, a one-time thing, but this name kept appearing for decades and decades. You know, and it was. I also was wondering if you could comment. I mean on Alice's level of popularity. So in Vienna, she has this kind of number one cookbook, it sounds like, and she has this cooking school. And uh, so I think of her, correct or incorrect, you're welcome to comment, as kind of a Julia Childs of Vienna. In my head, that's how I think of her. And then she gets to England and then this country and that whole, that whole identity is gone. Hmm. Or did she always hang on to that identity, you know, and, and, and continue yeah. to talk about it, even though, even though the book did not, I know you also were both children and you didn't hear her talk <laughs> about it so much, but, um, but I'm, I, I am wondering if she, you know, I guess that goes back to the other question though, about how did she cope with it, you know, and it sounds like she kind of just tried to go on. I think when when she, she when she was um, and she worked in Chicago and in the Midwest, perhaps she felt um, a bit um, isolated. But uh, moving to New York and um, and working in New York, and of course there were lots of immigrants in um, in in Washington Heights. Um, I think it was Washington Heights, and um, so Katrina knows that much better. So, but she um, she says in in um, uh, her little um, summary that uh, that people still. Um, you know, whenever she met an immigrant, uh, a refugee, a fellow refugee, they said, oh, you're Mrs. Orbach, and uh, I've never met you, but I brought your cookbook with me. So she was a minor celebrity in New York in, in, these, in these circles, and, and that, that must have been um, very nice for her. But um, of course, um, yes, Katrina can answer this much better, I'm sure. Well, I think she used her cooking to survive, even in the United States. You know, her sons were not at that point they supported her as best they could, but they. my father was a student for many years. He eventually got his medical degree, but he had to start over, had to go to college again first. And um, anyway, he had a long path to becoming an MD, but he, he had, you know, pennies to give her. And I think Karina's father was more employed and he was a little older and more uh, financially able to help his mother, but still they were not, you know, rich, or rolling in it. So she had to support herself. And you, know, you think about her, she was in her 50s already in England when she came here. I, I've forgotten how old she was when she finally emigrated to the United States, but 60. Yeah, she was 60, but she had to work. And she worked as a dietitian or somehow in a big in a hotel in Chicago. I think first she was a cook for several summer camps around. Mm -hmm. The United States, which again, I never knew this part of the story until we dug through her papers. Well, we, I, ha I had the box and everything in German I sent to Karina because I can't read it. And she discovered all these 
things that I had no idea that that Alice had done. But she was a cook. She worked in that hotel, and I think that's the job from which she retired. And my father moved to New York, so she moved to New York, and was then a retiree. And both her sons helped to support her. She had a small Social Security pension. She only worked for a few years, so her pension was was minimal. Um, no restitution yet, but she survived and she cooked for parties and not for money, but just for fun. And um, she, I think she looked after children. I know she worked for a family for a long time. Well, I don't know about a long time, but she worked for a family of two physician parents and she looked after the children and cooked for the family at some point in New York. I think she was technically retired, but still she, she found a way to let her skill um, keep her alive and you know and it entertained her in her later years as it just gave her such joy and yeah. it's wonderful so um in this research Karina and then Katrina as someone who is going along in Karina's research <laughs> what um was the most surprising thing you would say you discovered <laughs> oh, that's a big uh, question I know Big question. Well, first of all, um, her resilience is something that I admire very much. So that's something that um, I keep telling myself not to be so spoiled and not to have um, first world problems. But um, remember um, what this generation of um, women went through. So um, and um, how tough they had it and um so no I, I i and then i found out a lot about my father but that's a completely different story and that's in the book as well so um i i, I learned a lot from alice i learned a lot from her and um i i yeah i was very impressed by her my my most surprising thing was um learning about all those letters that she wrote to the publisher i knew she was often when I was a child yeah brought back those dandles and uh, <laughs> and fancy wool coats for winter <laughs> the kind of thing that you just didn't wear <laughs> I think I used the dirndl once for a Halloween costume <laughs> I just even my, my father couldn't even stand to look at it he just was so depressed about it. Yeah. but it was, uh, she went and she went to Badishal where she used to work when she was in Vienna. She worked there in the summer mm -hmm. at a resort or a spa as a cook in a hotel. Uh, when I, cause I know my father went with her and I think she was a great swimmer there. She used to swim across the lake. Um, I know he was always very proud of how good of a swimmer his mother was. But I thought she went just to visit friends and go to Bad Ischl and hang out at the lake and enjoy Vienna. What I didn't realize was that she was writing these letters that she was probably seething mad and furious and hurt and, and feeling helpless and just so irate. But that's not the memory I have of her trips she talked about and the dirndls and the coats and the lake and the mountains and she loved nature she loved being outdoors that's what I heard about these trips so that was just shocking to me and that was after you published the book in German I mean it, hmm. you know about those letters either no no that's that right was, that was the most surprising thing to me I mean the, the letters how, that Alice yeah how that's irritated right. she was and how persistent she was I had added another layer to her story of resilience and you see these little grandmothers all around us in the world and grandfathers you know elderly people you, you forget about the life they had most elderly people quite a, had quite a life and a lot of stories and it, it this whole experience helped me to stop and talk to older people more of course i'm getting to be one of them myself but <laughs> it's just just was a great reminder of what is behind the faces we see in the world. It's it's incredible. Yeah. So um, so thank you. I'll, I'll I'll go through some of the questions now. There's quite a few here, um, and so, uh, so to answer some of the questions right now, the book is coming. As we just talked, the book is coming out in English. So there's a new link in the chat 
in the um, chat so you can purchase it from Amazon in the UK. Um, someone asks, why is that related to the court cases? Was the Ernst Reinhardt publisher ever able to show that they paid any royalties to this elusive Rolf Roche? Because if not, that would be a stronger indication that this person never existed. That's a very, yeah, that's a very good question. That's um, exactly the key question in this whole affair. Um, when I uh, wrote the book in German first, um, my editor, my German editor, not my British editor, by the way, I have a, a very, um, Katharina Billenberg, a wonderful editor and translator, Jamie, uh, Jamie Bollock. And um, so my German editor was very scared we would get sued. So she said, we can't upset Ernst Reinhardt Verlag. And at that point I didn't have Alice's letters yet I didn't know that she had written these letters to Ernst Reinhardt Verlag so my German publisher we have to cut a lot of sentences um, you are too aggressive about Ernst Reinhardt Verlag they will sue us they will take the book off the market immediately if you call their former publisher a thief more or less which I didn't by the way I didn't call him a thief um, anyway so um, they were very very um, concerned and then um, when the book came out um, the opposite happened. So I wasn't sued. Um, and as I said, um, the CEO of Ernst Reinhardt Verlag contacted me and apologized and said from a more, more point of view, they had acted badly and they wanted to um, make amends. So, but there was one big question and that was my um, question to the CEO. And I said, so who is this Rudolf Roche? He was your author until 1966. Do you have any material on him? Um, and they said, well, we can give you material, um, the letters that your grandmother wrote, we can give you the contracts, um, but um, we can't give you material on him. Um, but he did exist. That's what they said. And um, I, to this day, um, I still hope that they will eventually tell me who he was um, and whether he got royalties. Um, but they haven't. This is the only answer that, I mean, this lady was terribly nice to me. She phoned me several times. She was very good about it, but she didn't want to tell me anything about Rudolf Roche. So I haven't solved that one. Wow, oh, what a mystery. <laughs> That's another question we received. Who received the royalties for the Roche book? Did the Nazis get the profits? Well, yeah, but of course I said, uh, you know, Katrina and I agreed. We, this is not about money. Uh, we don't want these um these royalties and i guess there must have been a lot i mean from 38 to 66 it was published um but that was not what we wanted we wanted the authorship back and we got that mm -hmm. and do you feel that you did this more in a way for your families today or for your grandmother or kind of both equally <laughs> question to you both katrina well, I didn't write the book, so <laughs> I had no motive. I just tried to help because I had my father's, you know, boxes of papers. Um, I, yeah. I can't answer that. I well, OK, I mean, for me as a historian, you know, um, I, I'm a historian first and a granddaughter second. And um, as a historian, of course, I um, want to solve riddles and I want answers to questions. And um, of course, um, a historian is a, like an investigative journalist or like a detective and we want to solve these things. And um, um, yes, so I, I, I just once I got hooked, um, I, I really wanted to find out what had happened and um, Yes, I, I was interested in it more as a historian than as a granddaughter at, from, at the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a, a question for Katrina here. Katrina, did your grandmother ever keep a diary? She had several. Um, the, she wrote her life story maybe three times at different points in her life. I found a letter from the 1950s somewhere to my family if I die, you know, with little facts and things in it. And she had a private diary that um, wrote about her marriage and her feelings about certain things that really was private. And I don't think much of that is in the book. I shared it with Karina, but I think we kept that some of that stuff to ourselves. It wasn't relevant to this story 
Um, but she she wrote, yeah, she did. She dictated her life story to a friend as when she was an older woman. Um, but she had several, I still have the things in her handwriting. I think I scanned most of them um, and sent them to Karina. It, I can hardly read the handwriting. I mean, it's very easy to decipher that, again, that old German style script in English in, in a, from a very, very old lady. Um, mm -hmm. It's a challenge, but it's, uh, yeah, she wrote, She, I think she felt some catharsis in writing down her feelings. I mean, who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so another, uh, someone else has written, just like the looting of art from their Jewish owners, this was taken away from Alice. Um, and indeed, that's one thing that makes this discussion so interesting. We rarely hear about these cases. Are there other cases like this that you know of right now that authors, of where authors' works were taken away? I think you did mention one or two already, Karina. Yeah. And, and the Financial Times is, is running a, a big story next Saturday um, on uh, restitution and um, exactly tackles that, that issue, you know, um, art restitution, um, but also um, this new field of um, authorship, um, of, of stolen authorship. So yes, it, it, it has become a, a very new subject now. Mm -hmm. But do you see more and more being done about it? Um, is it well, too new? It might be too new yet. Um, the problem is, of course, um, that we need the cooperation of the publishing houses. So um, German publishing houses can always claim that their archives are private and they don't have to give any access to historians to um, research in their archives. And actually, a lot of them have done that. They have um, blocked historians. And um, that's something we, we still have to work on. And um, But we, yes, I mean, I've met so many any um, people who are now interested in this and, and also the Nationalbibliothek in, in Frankfurt, the Exil Archiv Frankfurt and now the Leo Beck Institute. Well, you know, all these institutions can be a huge help. So to be connected and um, to, to talk about this with each other um, and find more cases that will happen now. Right. What's so interesting, we all know that books were burned and banned and banished and look at the world now especially this country oh my goodness anyway um what was so interesting at the beginning of the book where you talk about you know books that were too valuable to banish because mm -hmm. books made money for the publishers and yes. had the authors sign contracts i mean i think alice signed a contract give you know it was at the time legal after the mm -hmm. war not so much but you know, she got paid something for her rights and it was done. And, you know, it, it's complicated. What do you do? I mean, look at, look at Israel and the Palestinians. What do you do when someone is moved out of a place, you move into their house, generations live there, whose house is it? You know, it's it's a horrible situation. All over. Well, I think everybody can understand theft. I mean, um, in this case, you know, the, of course, uh, we know that the the Austrians um, just yeah robbed their neighbors' flats. I mean, they right. um, they were taking the typewriters, they were taking the um, um, the cutlery and so on and so forth. So that and was, the flats. I mean, people moved. They were taking, and the they flats. did not move out necessarily after the war. How whose is it after you know eighty years? It's very complicated and very difficult. And I think for a lot of these works, there were no survivors. You know, the, the authors died or were killed and they didn't all have heirs. So who's gonna fight for it? Who's, it's, it's- mm -hmm. It is who's, too like with, within the bigger picture of, but the word I can never say, well, Wieder Gutmachung, <laughs> the springing back together. I mean, it's, it's true that, uh, mm -hmm this idea of returning the rightful authors to the book symbolically fits into that idea as a German term so well, I think, to, to bring things back together, you know. 
Yeah. And for example, I mean, so far when we talked about Aryanized books, of course, um, the term meant that um, libraries had been looted, Jewish libraries had been looted during the Nazi regime. And um, these books have been restituted a lot now. And funny, I mean, oddly enough, um, uh, uh, last year, the, the Jewish Museum in Vienna gave back to um, Katrina and me a book that was looted from Alice's um, father's library. So we, we got an actual book, not a book that he had written he had written a few but no an actual book that had been looted so that was um what people understood under aryanized um books but now um we have to think of aryanized authorships yeah that, that's just fascinating you know i at leo beck i've done a lot of work with other libraries finding the rightful owners of looted books but but i myself never really until your work now have thought of this form of restitution, you know, actually the, the theft of an actual author's name. You know, mm. So do you know if there's cases where this also happened in music? Someone had asked. Oh yeah, that's a very good um, question because um, there was um, a very famous songwriter, um, Luna Beda. Um, he, uh, I, I mentioned him in the book as well. Um, he was um, writing it, all these, um, well, we would call them pop songs, you know, nowadays. It's um, Ich habe mein Herz in Heidelberg verloren, all these classic um, musical songs. And um, he was a Jewish um, a, a composer and writer, lyric writer. And um, he was killed in, in, in the, um, I think it was Auschwitz. Uh, I'm not, I have to look it up again. And he, and he um, of course, um, his music was um, taken away. And um, when the um, uh, when they wanted to name a street in Heidelberg, which is a beautiful town um, in Germany, when they wanted to name a street after him because he had been this um, great uh, lyricist, um, there was ex there was opposition, and um, because they said, well, perhaps he didn't write these songs, and um, and it's absolutely ludicrous because people um, just took over his lyrics or took over his songs and um, and um, earned royalties for a time. I think now his um, descendants get the royalties, but no, there, there were cases of um, music pieces being stolen and um, peop other people earning from royalties of, um, of famous um, composers and musicians. Yeah. Yeah, I had just actually, after I'd asked that question, I was actually involved in such a case, which, as oh, really? it is, it was, a, it was, I wasn't, it wasn't the case so much, but just trying to put the name back as the author, it was this small town in Württemberg, um, mm -hmm. it was, it was their beer drinking song, you know, how towns will have certain anthems, and this yeah. Jewish businessman who was important at the town had written it, and, uh, and then the Nazi time, that was kind of forgotten, and then the town, certain people in the town brought that back to everyone's attention. <laughs> you know, a funny, small example. Um, so um, I'll go on to the next question. I wonder if the author could speak from her historian's perspective rather than the family perspective to the parts of these stories that are particularly Viennese. And what I'm thinking of is the question of how slowly Austria has come to terms with this past as opposed to Germany and how that might impact this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, in the book, I quote a very famous Austrian, um, Jewish Austrian director who said that the, um, the Austrians became Nazis because they were anti-Semitic, um, while the Germans just became Nazis because um, they loved the Nazi party. So um, the Austrian anti-Semitism um, has always been considered to be more vicious. That was um, certainly the case when they, um, in 1938, um, humiliated um, a lot of um, uh, Jewish people on the streets. And we all know the, the pictures of them having to, to clean the pavements, that's something that didn't happen happen in, in Germany, so they, they were even um, worse. Um, that, um, I think, um, has, has been a, a problem. Um, uh, and after the war, of course, Austria uh, saw itself as the first victim of, um, or portrayed itself as um, Hitler's first victim. And um, it, it took much longer um, to cope uh, with um, their past or to, um, to understand or accept um, that they had been um, 
yeah, in, in involved in in, in these um, uh, crimes, and um, uh, I I think that um, Germany was better in, in in tackling it. I mean, I I grew up in Germany, of course, and um, I know that um, my generation um, was still um, considered too fragile. We were not allowed to go to a concentration camp, and and we were. I grew up in Munich, next door to Dachau, so we were considered um, um, to have to be sheltered from it. But at the same time, of course, we we learned about um, our past, and we learned to to face our past. So in, in Germany, education was the education system was quite good, I thought. And um, and I, for example, went to school with um, a proper neo-Nazi. So um, and uh, he wasn't the suckish kind. He was um, a very um, educated one, which is even worse, perhaps. And um, our teacher um, was brilliant in handling this. And we, we, we were both um, having arguments a lot, but debates a lot. But um, we had um, an excellent history teacher who was um, uh, helping us to um, understand each other, get to terms with each other. And I think nowadays he isn't a neo-Nazi anymore. So um, yes, Germany handled this um, better than Austria. Mm -hmm. So um, the next question, I've been saving this for the end but to talk more about the food because <laughs> i know i wanted to focus more on the issues of restitution in this project but it's hard to stay away from the food and someone asked wondering how you would describe the emotional impact of alice's recipes and cooking on the family it's maybe more for you katrina was it a form of comfort given all the loss they had experienced i think that's very true as food is for most cultures. Um, my grandmother cooked all our birthday cakes. Um, she gave my parents not only a copy of her cookbook when they got married with a little poem in it, but um, a cookie jar and promised always to keep it full. And <laughs> she did. Um, she catered, cooked when my parents had parties. You know, I grew up sort of during the Mad Men era, if any of you are familiar with that television show. It, it, you know, the big Friday night happy hour gatherings, whatever company or organization you worked for, there were a lot of social things that we don't really do that anymore. But at the time, people tra traded hosting duties and Alice often provided the catering. My mother was a is a, was a very good cook, but she did not like it. Um, and she did not bake. She was a cook. She didn't, she did it as a utilitarian necessity with some resentment, but she would call her mother-in-law often and she would <laughs> beautiful things for the parties. And, and uh, yeah, my, when my grandmother died, my father retired about that time and he started to cook and bake from her cookbook. Uh, you know, I don't think he could admit that he wanted to do it in front of his mother, but it became a huge part of his persona. And he started making all the birthday cakes for all his friends, all his, all of us. My kids still want me to make Opa's birthday cakes. Um, they did not know my grandmother, of course, so they don't remember them as Alice's, but they were, you know, they're Alice's cakes. My mother's favorite cake was one of Alice's cakes, which I, it's, it was very complicated to make. And I made it once for her birthday after my father died because he wasn't here to make it anymore. Oof, it, I, I made it once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was, you know, my father translated some of the recipes. He, they were all in, it was like a cookbook for people that knew how to cook. Like, you know, cook in a medium oven until done. <laughs> it, it, was, it was it's a very imprecise cookbook because I think people went had an oven that I mean you were still putting coal into it there were no thermometers when you know it just was a, a you have to already know how to do everything but I learned I as I said I was 28 when my grandmother died I learned to make some things with her she would show me the textures and I, I still make plum dumplings vegetable knudel wow. one of my favorite things and um I can still, my, my father came up with some shortcuts for things. He didn't 
rice the potatoes. He used Betty Crocker potato flakes, which work so much better and are so much easier. And they're just as <laughs> I mean, he he really perfected the temperatures, the the Americanized or weight measures of things, um, and I have some of those really good recipes. I have his notes in pencil in the cookbook. So don't cook so long or whatever. Um, and it it was a huge part of our family. I mean, a huge part. You know, when my father passed away and and at the memorial service, everybody that spoke about him talked about the cakes and they were his mother's cakes but yeah I still make them I still make cookies I you know it, it's it been a huge part of our our family because we had Alice with us we're very lucky yeah yeah um so I know there's also this documentary that is coming out in English am I right Karina that's right yes yes and it's we not did. out yet though people some people are asking about Oh, oh, that's very nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the um, it's um, it's coming out in um, in America, I think, at a few festivals. So we we have been invited to a few festivals already. Um, our English version. We did an English version and we did um, a German French version. So um, it has um, it will be shown in, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and, and France in um, on eighth of September, and in um, in America it will be shown at um, uh, two festivals so far um i think i hope it's coming to san francisco because then katrina can represent us um they also have a documentary festival in, in san francisco so um yes it it was wonderful to do that because um of course katrina is in it she's a um, key witness and um and then i interviewed um uh, children um who were in in windermere looked after by by alice um and then i interviewed lots of um, fellow historians um so i could show other cases of books I um, talked to a cookbook expert who explained to me how the how Wash um, changed recipes. Perhaps that's one thing I forgot to say that he did um, change some recipes. For example, Jewish sounding recipes were um, erased and um, uh, Germanized. So the omelette Rothschild became an omelette nature and the Jaffa cake. Um, it was also not um, uh, Jaffa cake anymore. So every, everything that sounded Jewish was taken out. So um, yes, yeah, so I have a lot of exciting um, people talking in, in this. And, and of course, we went to Harlex Manor. We went to this country house um, where uh, Alice cooked and we, um, we interviewed the historian there as well. So um, it, it's great fun. It's, it was filmed in Vienna, Munich. Well, it's not just fun, actually. It, there are funny sides and there are horrible, sad sides, of course, as well. Um, and um, especially the Holocaust side is, um, is of course, uh, pretty depressing, but we have also uplifting parts in this documentary. So yes, it should be watched. The, mo the most incredible thing in that documentary is uh, hearing Alice's voice. Um, <laughs> yeah describing i mean it wasn't take me the recording was not made at the time but there's a scene of the Anschluss, um in vienna and hearing her voice many years later describing watching this happen in front of her eyes was that was powerful and yes. i knew that voice because i grew up with it and i i was so shocked because a lot of the film is dramatized with people now you know impersonating Alice and she's not here so she couldn't be in the film but her voice is in it I just that was oof, I had chills. yes her, her voice is lovely of course and it has this charming Viennese accent and and then we we also have an um a very uh, famous Austrian um actress uh, reading extracts from from Alice's um uh uh autobiography so um that that center bag I, I think she's certainly um she's not known so much in america but for for germans that's a big deal and um she she also has this charming viennese accent but of course alice's voice on tape that is the best bit really <laughs> um and then uh, there's a few questions here and i'm kind of putting them all all together so i'll, I'll say all of them and then you can answer are Alice's cookbooks available in English? Can you post one favorite recipe here? Is the cookbook in English yet? And are the recipes available? 
<laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, the, the, my, my wonderful um, English publishing house, they um, uh, 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 translated a few recipes into English and they uh, did um, a great uh, little um, flashcards with them. Um, so perhaps we, we, we can post them later. On. Unfortunately, Alice's um, original cookbook is only in German and was never translated into English. So, um, yeah, that, that, that unfortunately we can't. Um, but Katrina might, might be able to post some of Alice's recipes as well. <laughs> Do you actually put some recipes from the cookbook in your book? Ah, no, 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 no. We, because we were a bit worried that um, people would misunderstand that um, this is a history book, you know, it is a history book and it, um, it is not a cookbook. And we were worried that um, if we do that, if you put in recipes, then it will end in the cookbook section and um, nothing against the cookbook section, wonderful section, but this is um, it's a history book and it has a lot of footnotes and it, um, I hope it's a written in entertaining way, but it's also a serious work. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that uh, that is all the questions for now. There's a, there, there's a few more, but we're pretty close to the end of time. So um, I wanted to thank you both for being here today and for learning more about Alice. You know, one last thing. Do you know what the document should also be available online if you can't get to the various film festivals and so on? Sure. I hope so. I hope PBS is buying it. So this is an appeal. Yeah. Okay. This is a great documentary <laughs> and you better buy it. Uh, right. Yes. It says. And then I will make that very public. We will make that very public. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, okay. Thank you both for coming. It's a fascinating new idea within the world of restitution to think about. So uh, just the power of the name, you know, and yeah. what that really means and is and its legacy. So thank you both for being here and have a good rest of the afternoon and evening, Karina, for you. Okay. Thank you, well, thank you Michael. Thank you so much. And thanks, yeah. Katrina. Thank for you. Time. Thank you.